Hi, I'm Brian Norcross. Welcome to Tracking the Tropics. On this program, we talk to the biggest names in the weather and hurricane business. Coming up on today's episode is the biggest name in Tampa St. Petersburg weather, longtime chief meteorologist at WTVT, Paul Delegato. Paul took over when the legendary weather icon Roy Leap resigned after 40 years at the Big 13 in 1997. Now Paul's kept the tradition at Channel 13 going into the modern era. WTVT has been an exceptional station for weather going back to the 1950s. We'll talk to Paul about that. And also, what makes Tampa Bay especially vulnerable to hurricanes and how you communicate in a region where hurricanes don't happen very often, but the risk of bad things happening is extremely high when one does come along. So let's take a quick break, and I'll be back with my conversation with the chief meteorologist at Fox 13 WTVT in Tampa, Paul Delegato, in just a moment. Hi, Paul. Thanks for coming on. Sure, glad, glad, glad to be here, Brian. Pleasure. So pretty much every meteorologist I, I've ever met, uh, especially in TV, and maybe any meteorologist, says there was this storm when they were a kid and mm -hmm. so forth and so on. Was, was that your story? Uh, I, you know, I guess so. I mean, I, I know a lot of you watching right now certainly remember the blizzard of 78 mm -hmm. and, and in yeah. in our kind of generation in right. my harvey age, leonard we, yeah uh -huh. harvey leonard <laughs> yeah. and uh i interned with harvey who just who just retired um that was the storm that you know i look back on and i was a senior in high school so this was in the boston I, area the blizzard of 78 was native, really impactful yeah, native, yeah suburb of boston and, yeah. I, and i remember sitting in in, in school looking out the window at noon on February 6th and saying, this is gonna, you know, just looking at this is really bad. And then never going back to school again for three weeks. And this is in a area that it snows a lot. So, yeah, you know, yeah. we miss a day or two. We don't miss three weeks of school. And, and it actually worked out good because I was a senior in high school and that means you never make the time up. So that was a big <laughs> bonus for us. Right. Uh, but that was the, you know, the storm that, you know, I, I still think back on. And as long as it was, what's it like 40, it's a 44 years ago now, Four, yeah. yeah, 44 years ago. And I still remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's something. 40, 41, see, no, 38 inches of snow at my house. Yeah. But then you had winds also 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. Yeah, no, if you go back and look at the uh, TV coverage, uh, recently looked at TV right. coverage uh, of uh, that storm, it's and the radio coverage of WBZ is really, sure. really, really um, monumental, actually, one of those moments in broadcasting. So then, uh, so you're a senior in high school, and, you know, you get the meteorology bug, and you end up going mm -hmm. to Linden State uh, in, in Vermont, or had you already planned to do that before the blizzard? I think I, I planned on I planned on doing that, um, and what a great experience that that was uh, being up in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, which is um, you know extremely cold, extremely rural, but just a, a close knit community of of meteorologists that that came all around, generally out of the Northeast, and right. I'm still friends. Uh, Nick Gregory, who, who who works at at Fox Five there in New York, and just a whole bunch of uh, us have stayed in contact together. And, and that was a great experience. And then when I graduated, you know, it's, I think I graduated during a time, this is the 1982 when the economy was not good. Right. So right. I, I, I couldn't find a job, mm -hmm. bank teller for a year, and finally found a job at a private weather company in Ithaca, New York, mm -hmm. uh, for a, a guy named Kevin Williams, who's up in Rochester now. And, and I, I moved from Natick to Ithaca to not be on TV, but just to do private forecasting, ski resorts, um, public works, newspapers, radios, radio stations. And I got paid four dollars an hour. And, and that was my and that was my first job. Yeah. And, when you were in college, was, did you, you know, think you wanted to be on TV? Was that the goal? Um, you know, I think I, I did. But, you know, I had this ridiculously bad Boston accent. Uh, <laughs> had a st occasionally stuttered and and knew that I had to work through some some issues as to kind of get rid of all that unless I wanted to stay and, and be on TV in Providence or Boston or, or Portland Maine but um, 
it was something that was in the back of my mind that, that I certainly wanted to kind of go down that road. But it's tough to get that first job, especially when you're in the Northeast, not a lot of small markets. So uh, I went to work for a private company just to get some experience. And you got uh, so you were doing radio, so you got to work on your voice some. Yeah. Because then eventually you, you made the transition to TV. How'd that happen? Uh, went to, um, first of all, I went to another private company called Weather Services Corporation mm -hmm. in Bedford, Massachusetts, and, and came to help to put together that color weather page. Uh, USA Today had that big color weather page on the back right. page, and of course, newspapers. Yeah, that was kind of groundbreaking at the time to, that to was have a big that deal. color and, thing in a newspaper. Yeah, yeah. so I worked on that, and, and that was successful. Did some, some more radio, and then my first TV job was up in Portland, Maine at the CBS station, WGME and um came in to do uh an audition and, and and this is a funny story i went on tv and it was the first time really ever on on tv and uh, I, I couldn't read the numbers i i, I for the first time i realized that i, I had i need to get contact i need to get glasses i just mm -hmm. I, I was nearsighted so on the on the teleprompter where the maps are i, I realized that I couldn't see the temperature, so I was making stuff up. And, and, and the news director came in and said, you did an okay job, but you kept on reading these numbers and they were wrong. Can you get some glasses? So I went, uh, went to the eye doctor, got some glasses. And then what was interesting, the next day I came in and did, did the weather. And then the news director came back out and he goes, well, what are you doing here? You're, you, the glasses that I bought were photochromatic. So it looked like I was wearing sunglasses. And, and the guy was, was saying to me, are you trying to be funny? You don't wear sunglasses on TV. So <laughs> that was a whole nother story. Uh, he thought I was being a wise guy. He goes, what, what are you actually going to be on TV with sunglasses, dude? And, and uh, I said, no, I just didn't realize that they were, were going to be photochromatic. So I stayed in, basically, bottom line is I stayed in Portland, Maine for a year. Uh, still look back on it. It's just such, it's such a great town, great city. It is a great place. Uh, first day, first day on TV. Um, high, you know, high temperatures, single digits. Lo low temperatures, minus ten, minus twenty. Mm -hmm. um, and then I stayed there for a year, and then went to Winston Salem, North Carolina, as the chief meteorologist at twenty five years old. That was a pretty good job for me. But the thing about going to Winston Salem, North Carolina, is I'd never left New England. So I'm here. I am in Winston Salem, North Carolina, and I'm on TV, and no one can understand me, and I can't understand them. Because mm -hmm. I'm a I'm pack, pack in the car, chance of a shower, and I'm in the Bible Belt of North Carolina, Tobacco Road. So I had to be sent away to speech school for a, a week at a lady's house in, in Dallas, where I sat on a in a kitchen table for a week uh, saying shower, shower, <laughs> shower, not shower. Yeah, so that, uh, that I, my... I knew that lady. She was really very talented. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I worked with her, yes. <laughs> So, uh, so all right, so that, I I get that. So that's that's right. what stations did back then. Actually, they they you know spent the money, took the time to to uh, yeah. help. They had no work. choice. I mean, I would go, right. I would do these school talks, and and I would be at the school, and the, the kids would be looking at me, and I'd be looking at them, and and there was a definite. You know, difficult of communication. Um, they were saying, you know, they probably I, never heard that accent in, before. Well, the, I remember the one, one kid going, "Can I shop in my writer?" I'm going. <laughs> Sh sharpen your right out. What does that mean? I mean, it was to sh sharpen a pencil, but I never yeah, heard yeah. it. Yeah. Never heard it that way. So, um, yeah, so the I South there is an experience. Years. I agree. Yeah, it really is. And then I stayed there four years, and it's turned out to be a great, great weather in the Piedmont in mm -hmm. North Carolina. All four seasons. We had a big tornado, um, a big tornado that went through Winston Salem. Um, I think it was back in like 88 or 89, and then um, ended up coming to Tampa. Uh, as as a weekend meteorologist in in 1990. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you connect then, with with 13 with Channel 13 there and and the legendary TV weather guy Roy Leap uh, that built a huge weather facility and you know it was it was this iconic. Yeah, I mean the thing is you you, know, you come you come down and you interview at the station and I knew knew the legacy of Roy. And you walk into this weather department, which at that time we had a brand new TV station it was built in 1989. And you walk in, Brian, and I'll tell you the I don't know if you've been in our TV station, but the weather the, the weather office is the size of most newsrooms. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and it's, it's still to this point we, we, we always say we have so much space that we need to utilize better. And it was really 
something that almost took my breath away because I'd, I'd worked, you know, when I was up in Portland, Maine, I had a little, a little cubicle in the corner. Mm -hmm. right. And when I was in Winston-Salem, I had my little spot in the corner of, of a newsroom, like a little desk. And that was it with the, with the graphics. And here I am walking in and you feel like you're walking into NASA. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was a, you know, monitors. We had, you know, we had, um, we had, a, he was the first, first weather TV station to have local weather, um, the whole weather office is run by IBM mainframe computers, and and we had yeah, the, the, the radar from way, going way back uh, yeah. to the fifties. I mean, it was it. Uh, I mean, I knew Roy, but I've never been to the right. station. Um, and uh, Roy was an FSU guy, and we yeah. connected, uh, you know, in the nineties uh, because of that before. He retired and, and you know i lived over on the east coast of, of florida as a kid over right. in the melbourne area and i put up a big antenna so i could see the big 13 from uh tampa because they did the news in color starting in right. in 1966 and the orlando stations which were the local stations for the melbourne area uh, just did black and white and i should mention by the way that the guy before roy leap at 13 was charlie stump and Charlie sure, yeah. Stump, right, was this first meteorologist, uh, one of right. the first meteorologists um, in the country, but certainly the first in Florida on uh, Channel 13 in, in Tampa, St. Pete. And he went to Orlando. So he was the guy that was on, uh, that I, I watched on, um, on WSH Channel 2, but of course right. I watched him in black and white. And when I could get Channel 13 from Tampa, St. Pete, it was, uh, it was in color. So... I, yeah, it's I, crazy. I, like I mean, I mean, the, the TV station, technically, I mean, I guess there was a chief meteorologist briefly before Roy, but I mean, yeah, that was Charlie. That was two, Charlie. Stump, yeah, there was so I guess you'd say three chief meteorologists in the history of the TV station. Right. And which is, you know, I, I mean, literally, I mean, there are some stations that will go through three chief meteorologists in three years. Exactly. So. In, in the whole history of the TV station, there's been three, me, Roy, and Charlie. And, and um, you're just, just walking in there and, and looking at, you know, it's tough to say no to a job offer from a TV station like that, especially when, you know, I'm kind of a geek. I mean, I, I take my weather seriously. And to be able to work there, I figured at the very least, I would get an instant credibility for, for working in that weather department. Because uh, it was, it is, still is recognized around the country as one of the better uh, TV stations as far as weather goes. And it's turned out uh, incredible people uh, from all over the country, including uh, actually one of my mentors, Pete Giddings, who I worked yeah. with in my first full-time weather job was in San Francisco, and, and I worked for Pete. And I learned, uh, I, I learned an awful lot. Did you, yeah. when you went down there, when I went to San Francisco, I came out of FSU mm -hmm. and um, worked in Tallahassee, and <laughs> then I went to San Francisco. And forecasting West Coast weather was like a completely different planet. I mean, it was, if yeah. Pete hadn't been there, I don't know what I would have done because it was really a foreign thing. Well, my, the microclimates are incredible. Well, the microclimates yeah. and, and the, you know, the marine layer and right. the depth of the marine layer and uh, yeah. the coastal ranges and the gaps in the coastal ranges <laughs> and all this uh, stuff that you have to kind of get in your mind before you can make a forecast for the Bay Area. And, uh, but I, uh, when you went down to Florida, I mean, that's about the opposite from from New England. And I, I guess sure. the, the Piedmont is a little bit in the middle, but still Gulf Coast weather is a completely different thing. You yeah. Know, and I, I tell you, you that I say that? I'll say this now and I say it on TV a lot. I mean, anyone that says, you know, you know, this, Brian, when you say you live in Florida and you're a weatherman or meteorologist, mm -hmm. that they, they say, OK, you live big deal. You know, you're there uh, partly cloudy. It rains at four o'clock in the afternoon and it's done. And then I say, well, if, if anything, it, it doesn't really rain that. I mean, it does, but sometimes it, it's not. <laughs> yeah. It's it's not four o'clock in the afternoon. And I mean, sure. I, I mean, I'm sitting here now in Tampa and during the course of the summer, we'll get some thunderstorms at four o'clock in the afternoon. But more often than not, it's not. It's not raining at four o'clock and it's happening this past couple of days. Uh, I've been we've had rain at night and we've had a southwest wind. So. The weather here is is a lot more challenging than than people think. It's it's about the timing of the rain in the summer. It's the amount of rain. Um, it's it's hard. I mean, the the winters are actually, you know, obviously a lot easier because we'll, we'll get long stretches of low humidity and a lot of sunshine. 
but every market has its challenges. And for us, you know, it's it's thunderstorm activity timing and, of course, uh, the risk of tropical activity from the from the Gulf and the Caribbean, the Atlantic. Yeah. Let's take a break. More with Paul Delgado in just a moment. So you started doing the, the weekends, but then you ended up uh, on the morning. So how had yeah. that, you know, had you done that shift before? I mean, it's uh, it's unfun. It's hard. I mean, and, and the thing that, and I think what's good about that shift is that you really have to, I mean, you know, you're a meteorologist, but any meteorologist that's, that's doing a morning show becomes part of, of, of a show. And, and right. you have to show more personality. There's more ad-libbing. Um, and you're on a lot. You know, before, before you know it, you're, you're reading school lunches mm -hmm. and, and you're playing little games and, and you're half meteorologist and you're half, half host. And I think that in itself kind of makes you become a better broadcaster because mm -hmm. you just kind of have to get out of your little weather bubble and start opening up and, and becoming more of a personality than maybe... Uh, you're not when you're when you're doing the evening shows and the weekend shows because everything is here's do your three minutes of weather and you're done in the morning you're you're kind of involved with four or five other people and you become kind of part of a family and it, it's kind of fun uh the shift's hard because you know who wants to get up at 3 30 in the morning i'm not a morning person i remember leaving this house at 3 30 going you gotta be kidding me i mean uh, it's 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 hard and some people can do and it now they do it later yeah. you know and and now they yeah. are now i mean now they do it earlier people go in yeah. at two o'clock in the morning now uh, it's hard and then the thing is not only do you have to be at the station but you have to be on your game so you mm -hmm. have to be up and you have to be at it you can't be 40 50 percent you got to be at it and going and and our morning show is four to ten four yeah. to ten local news and you know dave osterberg who's our morning guy i say dave how do you do that and he goes he goes dude it's hard, but you know, I leave at 10 and I take a nap and I just have it down to a science, but it's not easy. And the older you get, that, that shift is, is, is tough. Yeah, but you know, uh, I, I recommend to young meteorologists that they take those morning jobs because exactly yeah. what you said, that, that you have all these different times you're on TV, you have to just make yourself be good on the morning yeah. show and uh, it really it really molds you as a personality i think and it and does it makes it make a big difference in my career and um it was more than just standing in front of you know when you're right because you're on you're on the morning show i think dave told me he's on like 47 times a morning so when you're on that much you're you're, you're talking and any young meteorologist you want to be on tv as much as you can exactly yeah it's yeah. it's it is the best thing to get started but yeah. <laughs> but I, I i never could stand that shift i never had to do a whole lot of it but boy it was uh, something so so roy leap retires in 1997 and and that was a huge event in the uh, yeah. in the tampa market I, re I remember that and for you uh, i imagine what do you remember about that time i just remember the, realizing that i had some pretty pretty big um shoes to fill i was fortunate and I, you know, I had been there seven years, so it, it, it was a, it was a big opportunity, but I think I had confidence that I could do it. Um, the station did a nice job of promoting me. Um, I'd been there just long enough where people knew me. Um, yeah. And that was back so, when TV had impact when, when you really could come into a market and establish yourself. It's yeah. When I first came, we, we were, we were a CBS station. I mean, we, and the ratings that we would get, in the evening for, for some of these shows were like uh, it, you know you look back and 15 ratings 13 ratings 12 mm -hmm. ratings you know f it's the numbers were absurd um and then we went from cbs to fox as part of that big shift in the early 90s I think 93 maybe was the shift and uh, that's a big transition when you go from you know cbs uh, the golden girls what else was on cbs back well then? no golden girls were nbc but but oh yeah. no you're right not golden Girl. um Murder, She Wrote? Murder, She Wrote, yes, exactly. But yeah. all these and iconic you, CBS shows, for CBS sure. CBS shows. Yeah. And then you go from that to Fox, to, to right. The Simpsons, and you go, how the heck are you going to make that transition work? Mm -hmm. And it did. We, we, we maintained our, our news legacy, and, and we have been the powerhouse station in this market from CBS to Fox forever. Um, and the news and, went to 10 o'clock at night, which uh, I yeah. think fits so well with the demographics in the market. In, right, in, right. in the market. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and um, so that, that, I think the transition went well. The thing that was, I remember back about it, it was 97. And you remember weather-wise in 97, it was a huge El Nino winter. So I right. took over for Roy in November of 97. And that December, and again, winters are dry, dry season. Mm -hmm. And I think we had around 18 inches of rain uh, in December. And wow. yeah, that's, that's unheard of. I mean, we, if 18 inches in July is frost would be monumental, but we had, we had just rounds of, of fronts and storms that kind of rolled across the Gulf of Mexico. And, and we ended up with, you know, just an incredible winter of 97, 98, which you know, that, that El Nino winter was something else. Yeah, that was a, a really strong El Nino. Yeah. So did, did you have a, a plan when, you know, when you became the chief there, replacing an icon, you know, had to be in your mind as something that you were going to do to make yourself stand out? Or was it just, you know, be as good as you can be and, and take it day by day? Well, I, I tell you, it's one thing Roy and I had in common is, is, is we take our job seriously. But, you know, I also thought it was it was important that that I just be, be myself and and. You know, one thing about this business, if you know, you can't look at someone else and say, I want to be like him or I want to be like her because you'll fail. You just have to be yourself and whatever your personality is, that's your personality. If, if you have a good sense of humor, uh, you should use it on TV. If you're mm -hmm. if you really don't, then don't don't try to be funny that much. Um, yeah, be so authentic. Just, exactly. Right. Just, just be yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't don't try to emulate anybody else. And, and I did, never went into his that, this job and said, I need to be another Roy Lee. I just said, I have to be who I am. And and that's what I've, I've done. I mean, I, I have my own personality, my own ways, but by the same token, I, I think I had a responsibility to follow in Roy's footsteps and that's to take my job seriously. So we take a job seriously, but at the same time, you try to have a little bit of fun. You, you try to connect with the viewers and with your personality and i think it's worked out pretty well for me in the station so when you came to tampa did you appreciate the magnitude of the hurricane problem in that area um i think i just knew it was something that that was a big part of our climate and something mm -hmm. that um you know when i came there we really had I'm trying to think back um you know the storm that i remember obviously was andrew um, right. I just remember being on TV and, and we covered it. We, the, the, the good thing about our station is, is, you know, we cover these hurricane events as if they're coming here, as if they're coming to Tampa. So even though Andrew wasn't coming here, we still cover it as it's coming here. So I remember Roy was really proud of the fact that his big radar, yes. which was this monumental radar, could see Andrew from from the station yeah, there where the radar was on in, that. In the back of my office, there's right. a huge poster of, of our radar showing the eye of, of Andrew going across the Everglades. Mm -hmm. um, and we picked it up, you know, up, all the way up here in Tampa. And that's huge, still there. And um, and, and we tracked it all the way across the state. And, that was, and it was a big promotion. But, you know, really had nothing, nothing here right. in Tampa Bay because we we're on the, regardless of the storm, we're kind of on the, on the north side, so the winds were mainly east northeast. We had no flooding, and and it was a pretty much a non-event for us, but obviously n not a non-event in South Florida. Yeah, well, it was a relatively yeah. small, physically small, the compact right, uh, right. storm, compact storm. Yeah. So the, the big events in in uh, the Tampa St. Petersburg area, you know, are like 1950, 1921. I mean, not to mention the biggest one in 1848, right? Right. Uh, yeah, do you talk about those like long ago storms or how do you talk about the hurricane threat there? All, all the time. I mean, when I'm when I'm doing the old Kiwanis Club meetings and the, mm -hmm. and the school talks and hurricane specials, and it's always about, really, it's a lot about the 1921 storm mm -hmm. because um, so much about that storm is relevant in the sense it happened in October and we, and we really harp on the fact that on the west coast of Florida, if we're going to get a, a direct hit in a storm coming in in the Gulf, I'd say it can happen in, in July and August and September, but it, just the way the upper level winds are, it's more apt to happen either very early in the season. And if it does early, it's probably not going to be a very powerful storm, but it's going to be probably a late September, October storm. And that's what the hurricane of 1921 was a, a, right. a mid to late October storm. Um, and if that was to repeat itself now, and no reason why I can't, it, it would be 
you know, incredible devastation. Yeah, so there's a you Category know. 3 went in near Cedar Key, I think, to, yeah. to the north. Uh, I went city. in, um, yeah, just north of Tampa Bay. And then, um, you know, we had a southwest wind blow across Tampa Bay, probably, you know, 110, 120, and all kinds of, you know, all kinds of damage. And fortunately, back then, there wasn't a lot here. Mm-hmm. But if if it was to repeat itself now, it would it would obviously not be good. Yeah, I wrote in my book that I wrote uh, 15 years ago now that you know the people in Tampa should be looking at Providence, <laughs> where they got right. a whole series of storms that pushed the water up Narragansett right, right. Bay, right, and flooded down Bay. Providence, yeah. right. Kept happening, kept happening, and finally they put up a big dike over, yep. uh, you know, to stop the water from from doing that that they put out there. If there's a hurricane because it's the same kind of configuration if you get that storm sure. just to the left of the entrance of that big bay front right yeah and anyone who lands i mean it's funny when you land at, at tampa international uh which is a great airport but if you land from the south mm-hmm. you'll end up kind of curving down through pinellas county and if you look out the window and you see these homes and you, and you just i mean i mean from the vantage point of a plane they look like they're on the water. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all flat. It, it all looks like it's, it's at the level flat. one level. You're right. Same yeah, thing in Miami, by like the way. It has that same kind of look about it when you come in on this game bay. Yeah. If you add 10, 10 feet of water to that water, <laughs> all those homes are going to be in trouble. And it's true. Right. I mean, the evacuation zone maps are are, are not pretty for us. I mean, the, the, the zone A is is extensive. Yeah. And so then zone A being, being category one storm nominally. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. yeah. So if you, yeah, if you read accounts of the September 1848 storm, I mean, sure. it's just, That's interesting uh, too. Uh, you know, it's just yeah. scary to think about what would happen. The water went all the way across Pinellas County, you know, where St. Pete is. And then there was another one in October, <laughs> three weeks later, that wasn't quite uh, as strong. But, you know, I guess it's true. Like you say, of any Tampa Bay hurricane, there's just a lot of people living on land that the water is going to take over. I mean, it's just a lot of low that's, territory there. How do, you, and, uh, how, do you, how do you communicate? I mean, there's so many issues of <laughs> getting people to motivated to move because they have to move if, if this could happen. Um, you know, I'm sure you've thought this out and kind of come close to yeah, having I mean, implemented it a few times. It's, it's on so many different levels. I mean, I, I, we could start with discussing the fact that we probably have a lot of viewers um, that don't understand that if you're if you're living in Lakeland or you're living in Plant City or uh, towns that are inland, that they're not in an evacuation zone, right. and and that in itself is a challenge because everyone thinks they're in an evacuation zone. They don't. And they a lot of people don't understand you're you're not in an evacuation zone because it's going to be windy. You're in an evac- evacuation zone because the Gulf of Mexico could end up in your living room. That that, yeah. that that's why you're. That's why you're evacuating. And, and I think that message in itself sometimes is complicated because I get emails in October and, and July saying, hey, I live in I live in Dade City, which is way inland. Uh, what, now, what, what level do I go? Is it B or D here? What is it? And, and people don't understand that it's yeah, it's yeah. you're escaping the water is what, is what you're doing. That in itself is sometimes a difficult message. Yeah. Did, do you think the people that live uh, in Pinellas, or along Tampa Bay or Old Tampa Bay or on the Inner Bay Peninsula there south of downtown, realize how low the ground is they live on. It really is. And, the, you know, a Category 1 would would flood them that they don't have to, you know, let alone a Category 3 or 4. It doesn't have to be some kind of experience, extreme Yeah, event. well, you, you, would hope, you would hope when they got their, their flood insurance bill every year that at least would remind them when they're writing out that check. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I mean, I think people are cognizant of it. I, I, I think a lot of it is, you know, how it is in life. The day by day, there's uh, so much to worry about. COVID, I mean, economy, where you go down your list of things in your head that you think about a day by day. A lot of it is, in fact, my dog's going to end up hopping up here, Brody. Brody come on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Your famous dog, yes. Do you yes. want to introduce the dog? <laughs> Whenever he knows when I'm, when I'm talking that he, want, that he wants to come up and say hi. It's kind of like a thing. Hey, buddy. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, I, 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 I just think that there's so much that we think about in, in our daily lives. And we look out, look, look out the window here. There's not a cloud in the sky that you kind of worry about it later. Yeah. When, when, I, when, when it's coming, I'll worry about it then. Yeah. And that, I think that's how it is for, for most people. You do urge people to have a plan. So you hope that if, you know, in, in a week from now, if, if a hurricane was approaching from the Caribbean, that people would 
be, would take it seriously and, and use the plan that they that they hopefully have put together. Well, my experience uh, in South Florida over a lot of years of this is that oh, maybe twenty percent of the people really are ready, and the rest of them deal with it in some level. Some of yeah. them are, have just don't want to think about it intentionally. Right. They don't want to think about yeah. it because right. it's a pain in the neck to think about, right? Uh, and yeah, I think and they rather not. And I think a lot of people think I, I'll always have time. Right. Uh, unlike unlike a tornado coming uh, that you just have to scurry and get into a safe place. I, I, I think people always say I always have the benefit of time. I have a week. If the storm's coming, I'll have five days. And I'll worry about it then. And then when those five days come, you don't understand, you know, all the stuff you have to do. And then you're then you're battling other people who also said, I've got five days to do this. So you're in line here. You're in line there. You're trying to get water. You're trying to do this. And it becomes kind of difficult for those five days. Yeah, and if you have to evacuate, there's only so many roads right. going someplace exactly. safe, right? When you go out and talk to folks in the area there, do you, do does it seem like they know where they would go? Do they have a, a vision in their mind where they would go? I mean, here in South Florida, the the uh, you know people have done this enough that I mean they think they're you know okay we're going to Orlando they used to say and right. then in Irma they learned well there's no hotels in Orlando anymore so we have to keep going to Atlanta you know so there's just more practice uh, coming out of South Florida than there is right. out of the Tampa Bay area I just wonder if people really have a vision you know I think and I think this is one thing I've talked a lot about Brian is is that I think we we have a problem here we had a problem with Irma. Um, is that if a big storm is coming, people just want to leave. Mm -hmm. So even though they're in a well-built home that is, has no chance of flooding, they don't want to be part of it. Right. They just want to get out. So I can't tell you the number of people that left here during Irma and went to um, Atlanta, went to Jacksonville, went to Orlando, and the number of people that left here went somewhere else and ended up losing power and having a more difficult situation where they went than if they would have had if they simply had stayed and then it was a pain and in the I neck to get back <laughs> and we, we have i-75 that, right. that heads up to atlanta and i say the last thing you ever want to do is plop yourself on i-75 and and try to get out of here two days before a hurricane hits and and one person runs out of gas or there's an accident it's just it's just a nightmare it's not fun and i always say your home's your castle so if you if you can stay I would say you're better off staying. Mm -hmm. um, or you leave you very, know, very early. I mean, you just decide right. we're going to take a vacation this week and we're going to button up right. the house and take a vacation five days before and most I of the heard, time I it heard, won't, won't I, happen. The inbox, the common thing that I heard was I should have listened to you and I should have stayed. I should have yeah. listened to you. <laughs> I left and what a nightmare. That was a disaster. Right. Um, I mean, there, there, I mean, I'm, I'm, the thing is you, you have to leave. I mean, you're, you're, there, there are times when you have to leave and you're, you're, you could flood there, there but, but there's also many, many times where a chunk of our population is not going to flood and they're in a concrete, you know, block home. Sometimes you, you better off staying. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Yeah. It's a, it's a yeah. dilemma. I mean, it's the same thing yeah. in South Florida for sure. It's time for a break. I'll be back with more in just a moment. So how did social media become such a big thing for you? What, what, how did that start? Well, I, I, I just, I kind of saw this coming back and I always tell my news director, like 2010, I just, um, I just started posting stuff on Facebook and just kind of went with it and it became a day by day thing. And just, it's more just, uh, it's when you put a lot of time into something, you, you kind of hopefully get something back from it. And I have put, a lot of time uh, posting almost every single day uh, on something. And, and you know, I, I've learned uh, over the years what does work on social media, what doesn't work on social media, what time of day to post, what kind of, I mean, and the thing about social media, and it's kind of, again, it, it truly is a love-hate relationship, is that um, it does serve a purpose in, in getting eyeballs to, to get into your sphere, get into kind of your life. And when there is, um, you know, the pictures of the dog and the pictures of, of, the, of the memes and all that stuff, ah, 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 it's funny, it's great, your dog's great. But you hope when a hurricane is coming that those people are in your sphere 
and they're going to say, okay, I'm here, and now I'm going to follow him. Because when, 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 when it gets tough, when the weather gets bad, you know, Brody goes away and the funny memes go away, and it's seven, eight straight days of pure meteorology. Yeah. And that's when it, it really works because you end up, um, you end up people messaging, when are you going Facebook Live? When are you going live again? Well, when's your next post? Well, when are you going to, and you know, you do these posts and, and, and they're kind of good because you can, you can sit for a half hour, if I can find a half hour in the day when a hurricane is coming and you can really explain from your heart what you think is more so even than on TV because you can just, you can make a post and this could happen, that could happen. This is what we need to watch out for. This is what I'm concerned about. And people love that stuff. Yeah, and because I mean, there's no they, producer they love, in your ear, right? There's nobody saying there's the no, off, no the sense off, you have to get off. Yes, the yeah. off-the-cuff stuff right. that is is written like um, like we're talking now. Yeah. Um, and it's different than what it is on TV. And and people love the, those. And I'll even sometimes I'll do it. I'll just say random thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then you do 20 thoughts of this could happen. That could happen. I remember this happened in, in 21. This happened here. Irma did this. Remember all kinds of stuff and telling people you don't if you're home and you live in Plant City, your home is safe. Don't leave so much. And people love it. So that that is where I think social media um, makes a huge difference in, in what we do um, and really helps. And it's, and it's in those, those type of cases. And you get on social media, you get the, the feedback from, from people, which is a big difference, don't you think? Right. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, you, you, I would love to be able to sit there and answer the comments because, but then it, it would be my job. I would, I, that would be my job for three days to sit on Facebook and answer people's comments. But you do get a sense of what they're thinking and, and, and you do once in a while you see a comment, they say, I have to answer this because she, this, we have to straighten this out. Yeah, but, I, I think um, it makes you a better broadcaster if you have that input yeah. that you don't have on TV. I agree. I agree 100 um, percent. So I, I think it play and I think those Facebook lives, you know, we, we have done Facebook lives and my news directors come in and said the number of views you have on that Facebook live is like rating points. I mean. It, it, uh, that's a big number because that, that's that's a huge. We'd have two, three, four, five hundred thousand views mm -hmm. on these on these Facebook lives. Sometimes over a million, um, and they're all around the world. They come to the point where, when Irma was coming, it seemed like anyone that had any connection to Tampa Bay, they could have been in China, they could have been in in Sydney, Australia. I was looking down. Hey, I'm in Sydney. I used to live in. in I'm following. I, I, I can't. So it becomes it becomes a big deal. And 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 again, that that's what when I think social media in our business really works. You know, it's an, uh, the way television has evolved in these days where we have so many more video sources and things are computerized yeah. and, and whatnot. You know, back, if you look at the videos from Hurricane Andrew coverage, I mean, that's what I was doing. I was essentially doing right. what we're doing here today, yeah. right? Talking exactly. about it and spent hours and hours and hours doing that. And, and people really appreciated that. But, but TV isn't structured that way now you have this little window of time it's not little i mean they give you substantial time i'm sure uh but but still it's from there to there you're, you put in your when graphics you're talking, and, so and there's and when you're talking and the producer just says you can go and you know in the back of your head you have no time limit you do have a tendency to become more conversational because you know you're not up to i gotta end this in, in a minute and a half and you yeah. kind of you broadcast differently when you know you have an end point but when you don't have an endpoint, it's I think it's more e it's easier to become more one on one conversational because that's how you talk and that's how it ends up going. And people really connect to that, that kind of conversational off the cuff way. Yeah, um, um, I agree with that. And, you know, back in again in Andrew's time, we heard from viewers because we had a special phone number that right. for in the lead up to it, people called and just asked questions, asked questions, asked questions, right. you know, nonstop, hundreds of them. And, you know, that was the way we interacted. But I, I really do think that that, yeah. that made me a better broadcaster is because sure. you people ask kind of the dumbest questions. But then you go, oh, I get where they're coming from and where the confusion point is, you know, yeah. and, and it really does help. So when you go to continuous coverage because there's some kind of big uh, event, how do you see, you know, Facebook and Twitter and all that working? Because, I mean, you only have so many hours in the day so right I, or only have so many I mean, minutes in the hours maybe a better way to put it yeah i mean i'll be honest i mean 
I remember when Irma was coming, um, we weren't on continuously back this, the days leading up. I mean, we're not on nonstop with Irma coverage, but I remember getting up at, at, at two o'clock in the morning and, and looking at the European model coming in and <laughs> sitting sitting in my office with, with the, the light on and, and putting a post together at, at, at 2.30 in the morning and hitting send and then going back to bed and then waking up and then redoing it again when the, when the 6Z data came in and it, it become it's a it's hard but you know you're running on adrenaline it's 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 something that that you, you you'll know you'll get through and as hard as it is you know it is our super bowl and yeah. i mean this is this is our super bowl and, and and we don't want anyone to you know have issues or have problems in their lives with a, with an approaching hurricane but as far as we're concerned this is when what we do is is the most important thing that we do so you, you, you sometimes it's 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 sleeping three hours a day for for five or six days. I guess uh, the, a good thing is that when a hurricane is coming in, if you do go into some kind of continuous coverage, that more people watch television. Right? More people turn on the television. Right. And these days, what's on television is online as well. So I, I think you know when it's in that it's it's approaching time period, then you can in some sense do less just exclusively for online if you if people know where they can watch because yeah. they're kind of in a different mode mentally and and uh, i mean i've thought about this if you know if if it had to be continuous where i'm focused on the television product on you know three or four times an hour so all i could really do was post in between tv hits you know how much could i do <laughs> could i do a you know a you know a thousand word I would do those sometimes yeah. 1500 word posts, you know, I don't see how to yeah. do that though, you know, in some sort of, of, uh, more imminent time frame. It's yeah, well, it's hard. I mean, leading up when, when you have the storm coming up, up the state, you, you, it's hard to get in front of a computer and, and put a 1500 word post. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, you can do it once in a while. If you have five people, you know, you, everyone at the weather office is there. So you, you'll say, Hey, you know, Tyler, can, can you do me a favor? Go, can you write a big post, do a blog, mm -hmm. something. But as you, when you get into the midst of, of the storm happening, it, it's hard to, I mean, you do a quick post and, but it's, it becomes more TV centric. Yeah, I, yeah, think. I think so yeah. too. Yeah, as, as the balance between, you know, what you do online and, and the amount of, you know, uh, CPU cycles in your brain that you allocate to TV leveled out, do you think, or is it going to continue to evolve or, you know, I'm asking you to predict the future here on how what what's on digital and social media versus what's on TV is somehow you know going to become something different, or do you think we've found some kind of balance? I, I don't know. I mean, you know, you just wonder. You know, everything kind of goes in cycles, and and the hot thing one year is not the hot thing five years from now. So you wonder the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram thing. You know, in five years from now. I'm sure it's going to be different. I, I just don't know. Will we? Will the, Will Instagram be the thing? Will Facebook go away? I mean, will there be another platform that'll come on, and we will find ways to do things differently? I mean, I look back on some of my old stuff from five or ten years ago, and it's probably a lot different now than it was five, ten years ago. So it's it always evolves, and yeah. and there's always something out there that that you will say, boy, if I had saw that coming five years ago, I'd really have it made now. Yeah, so, and you know. and we have an issue, don't we? That the young people don't really watch TV. No, and, well, actually, and when I'm out. I was in, how was in we Starbucks the other day, and when this lady came up, and she's probably you know 25, 30 years old, and introduced mm -hmm. her. So hey, I watch you all the time. I said, "You watch me? <laughs> you?" Yeah. And she goes, "Yeah, why wouldn't I?" I says, "Well, I, I always say whenever I see someone who's who's young that watches, I'm impressed." I, I says, "Yeah, I, I, I was making dinner. I have the TV on. I'm watching the news, and I think that's unfortunately." You know, it's it's not really the norm anymore because there's so much. You know, my, my kids will sit on the couch all day, not all day, but most of the day, and they're on TikTok and they're on Instagram, and that's their day. You know, when I was a kid, I was watching, I was flipping the the channels from four, five, and seven, watching watching the news nonstop, yeah. and th those kids are on Instagram now. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, or TikTok, as you say. I mean, yeah. have you thought about? Are you haven't? You know, I, I have thought about this and people have said, you got to go on TikTok. If you want those, you know, if you want young people to know what's happening with a hurricane, it's got to be on TikTok. Have you thought about 
how in the world you would do, oh, you do TikToks? TikTok to make it make sense on a, any kind of regular basis? I, I, I haven't, but um, because just posting a three minute weathercast on TikToks, we're probably not going to get it done. Yeah. There has to be some, some sort of catch, something to make it, whether it's kind of produced, uh, you know, but you're right. Any, any place that those eyes are is you want them to somehow watch, watch what you're doing. But yeah. Thanks a lot. Now something else got to think about. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, it's yeah. uh, really <laughs> tricky. So, all right, Paul, I, I, um, I sure hope the hurricanes stay away from Tampa Bay this year, but if something happens, I'll look forward to working with you. We'll, we'll talk. I'm sure at some point, hopefully not much. Yeah. Cause yes. that's in the Gulf that's right now, which doesn't appear much, but this, I always say that this, this time I always try to try when I take vacation, it's usually, um, it's usually July to early August. Thankfully, that's usually pretty pretty quiet for us. Then things get going in mid-August. Yeah, late uh, or after July 4th is usually yes. my time. Late June to after July 4th. That's usually my time. All right, Paul, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, buddy. I'll be right back. Just thinking about a big hurricane hitting the Tampa Bay area makes my head hurt, along with every emergency manager, I'm sure. Feels like a tricky job to be a broadcast meteorologist there. The whole west coast of Florida is so susceptible to high storm surge, it doesn't happen very often, but when it has happened in the past, before so many people lived there, it was really bad. In Tampa over the years, there have been scares and close calls, of course, but you have to go back to 1950 for a direct hit of any significance, Hurricane Easy, it was called. And for bigger storms, you have to go back to 1921 and 1848, as Paul and I were talking about. The September 1848 storm was the granddaddy of hurricanes in the history of Tampa. The water rose 15 feet in Tampa Bay. Now, you might wonder how we can be sure about what happened way back then. Well, it turns out there were people around. In the 1820s, the U.S. Army built a fort at the top end of Tampa Bay, essentially where downtown Tampa is today. It was called Fort Brook. A lot of things happened over the couple of decades after Fort Brook was put there, including a town called Tampa, developed right next to the fort. In October of 1846, about 20 years later, a super devastating hurricane moved north from Havana up toward Florida. It blasted Key West, in fact... There has not been a worse hurricane in Key West since 1846. It's the granddaddy for Key West. Well, that storm moved north along the west coast of Florida. It did damage at Tampa and Fort Brook, but it wasn't catastrophic. So they knew something about hurricanes there around Tampa Bay. Then just two years later, on the 24th of September in 1848, The barometer was falling, so they had an idea that a storm was coming, but they didn't know how bad it was going to be. The storm apparently moved north and then turned to the right, making landfall around Clearwater, just to the north of the entrance to Tampa Bay. That put the strong winds on the right side of the circulation in line to push water right into Tampa Bay and hold it there. The surgeon at Fort Brook reported that the water rose 15 feet, and a lot of that happened in just a few hours, and that was above the low tide level, he said. Turns out low tide came at noon that day. Now, other reports don't exactly support that timing, but we know that every wharf and ship and almost every building around Fort Brook was significantly damaged or destroyed. The Gulf water was pushed over much of where St. Petersburg is today and over the areas where thousands of people live now. So as Paul and I talked about, it's a daunting thing to think about. The storm was probably a Category 3, which we can estimate using modern models based on the level of storm surge. And by the way, another hurricane pushed about 10 feet of water into Tampa Bay three weeks later in 1848. So the question is, from a communication standpoint, how do you motivate all those people that live around Tampa Bay to get to safety or do whatever they need to do? It's tricky, like I said. Hopefully, if something like that happens, Paul's huge presence on social media would help. But boy, it's a scary proposition. If you enjoyed this program and you'd like to hear an extended version, you can get our podcast. Search for Tracking the Tropics with Brian Norcross wherever you listen to podcasts. 
For now, I am Brian Norcross. Thanks for watching. See you on the next Tracking the Tropics. I'm Amy Freeze. Welcome to Fox Weather's YouTube page. We have more great videos on the way, so make sure to subscribe to stay updated on all things weather.